I have to be honest. I can't tell as I look at you, Matt Bove. Are you, I think you're wearing green, but I can't tell. It's a dark, dark green, though, on this St. Patrick's Day, correct? Yeah, it's like a hunter green, I think is the name of the actual shade of green. We okay. were walking in the parade today, so this is what oh. I, I mean. I had a, I had a, I had a coat on over it, so I so don't own a lot of. I don't mean own we, a you lot mean of Channel green 7? clothing. We Channel Seven, and also me, my wife, and the baby. So nice. the baby had her first parade experience on wow. Sunday, which was cool. It was also a little bit strategic because when we go to Orlando for the owners' meetings, after we're going to do Disney World for a couple of days. So I think she's going to be around some parades there. So I kind of wanted to see how she would do around the crowds and with the noises and all that kind yep. of stuff. So she passed with flying colors when we're only 25 minutes away from home, we'll see how she does when we're a two and a half hour flight away from home. Yeah. Um, that not only he, she had her first parade experience, she was in a parade. I mean, I think that's super yeah. cool. <laughs> Right? Yeah, they were all there. They were all there for her. We took a couple of pictures of like her in the middle yes, of the road of course, with people on both sides of the road. And we're like, look at all these people it. are here for you. I love it. I love it for sure. Um, I've not like I'm not a super big parade person, but I mean, you know, in, in Buffalo, it's the St. Patty's Day Parade. It's a big deal. And you go and that's mm -hmm. what you do in Buffalo. It's a it, it's a happening. It's a thing. And how was the weather overall for it? Because it seemed like it was a little bit chillier today. But I think the the rain or slash snow, which actually it's evening now we're recording this. I think that held off in the morning, right? Yeah, it did. It was windy. So when it wasn't okay. windy, it was perfect. When the wind was blowing, then it got a little bit chilly. We all had a bunch of layers on and we stopped and got some coffee beforehand. So it really wasn't that bad. We're still pretty good considering we're halfway through March. And then, like I mentioned, the trip to Florida coming up is kind of the like carrot at the end of the stick that you're just chasing because you're like, yeah. okay, I know good weather is on the horizon. So hopefully this week isn't too bad. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I remember, do you remember 2012, uh, March of 2012? I don't know if you will specifically, but there's a reason I'm asking, obviously. Think about the Bills, March of 2012. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what happened then? Right around this March, time? March of 2012. Um, would that have been like a Fitzpatrick contract extension? Time? No, it was a. it was one of the biggest... Free agent signings took everybody by surprise, and it happened here in Buffalo. Mario Williams was yeah, it 2012? Mario Williams, 2012. Mario Williams, and the reason I bring it up is I remember it was right around this time. It was like 80 degrees during this week, and it was like the best time to bring Mario Williams to town and like show him the city. Look, it's great in Buffalo this time of year. It's March, and he comes in, he signs the contract. I remember that because we were we had just moved back to Buffalo, and Max wasn't even born yet, and we were in an apartment in. Um, I guess the Elmwood Village area, and it was so warm. We had our windows open, and people were walking everywhere for the parade. And it was, I just remember it because of that, because it was so hot that day. I remember Mario Williams' watch specifically listening to WGR for days yes. in a row, two days in a row, because I was a student in college, so I was at Buff State. And it was fascinating because you would be sitting in a classroom and if you had a work day, you could listen uh -huh. to the show online. And it was just nonstop coverage of, oh, he's going to Tempo for dinner and oh, his wife uh -huh. is coming into town and they're looking at houses. Right. And it was like, sign him to a contract before he leaves. Do not let him get back on the plane. I even remember where I was when he got on the plane to come to Buffalo. And the reports started that the Bills were going to bring Mario Williams there. Those were an exceptional couple days. And also, I'm glad you brought up Mario Williams. Mario Williams was really good for the Bills. He was. I feel, I feel like these people, there's some people out there who don't think he was that good. Mario yeah. Williams was great for a couple of, Like, he lived up to the expectation. Yeah, he was on a he was on some bad teams or middling teams. He part of the not breaking the drought. But it is amazing to me. How many people say, like, what a busted signing that was? It was no way a busted signing. I mean, I think it was $96 million he made. And, yes, that was, like, the highest paid contract for a defensive player. And, yes, you want even better returns as a team if you're going to do that. But the guy was – he was very, very good on the field. Was he great? I guess. I don't know. Whatever your definition in, is, he was the best defensive player in the team, basically, in, for the next few years or at least close in to it. In 2014, he had 14 and a half yes. sacks. Yes. He went – he went 10 and a half sacks, 13 sacks, there you go. 14 and a half wow. sacks, and then five sacks. So sure, the last year was not great. But I mean, those are three years where he played every single game. He started yep. every single game, and he had double-digit sacks in three consecutive years. His best year as a pro was in Buffalo in 2014. He'd never had that many sacks in another year. 
Well, yeah, I, I agree. The revisionist history on Mario Williams is kind of odd. 12 years ago. I remember that because it was super warm during that same week. And we're going to get back there. We're going to be a little bit warm, uh, warmer, I should say. But uh, right now, uh, as you, Matt goes to the parade, it's a little bit chilly. And then now it's snowing here as we talk. And it's always game day in Buffalo on St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody out there. If you're not watching, and you can do that, of course, on the South Sports YouTube channel, Matt has his Hunter Green on. I have my... <laughs> I guess Kelly Green on this would be like more of a Kelly Green, right? You think? Yeah, it's Looking clean. At that? All right, it's there very we go. Clean. Right. It's like I, the I like same it. shade as it's the same shade as the jerseys, the Eagles jerseys. It's nice. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Tried to wear the uh, the green today. We have yet to talk about the signing of Curtis Samuel, so let's start there because, well, I mean, obviously the Bills needed a wide receiver. We know that. I think they still need a wide receiver, but to me, this is the guy. As you know, I've talked a lot about here on the podcast. I've talked a lot about on the radio. There were two guys that I was most interested in the Bills trying to sign if they weren't going to be in the Calvin Ridley, Michael Pittman, Mike Evans type sweepstakes, which I never thought they would be. To me, these are the kind of guys that you could afford and it'll be good. Darnell Mooney, but he winds up signing with, where did Darnell Mooney go? Atlanta, right? Darnell Mooney went to Atlanta, I believe. And then, um, you know, Curtis Samuel. And I, I, I was so... I never even put the two and two together. Curtis Samuel with Joe Brady with Brandon Bean. I should have. I just wanted him anyway for the Bills, and they wound up planning on him. Three years, twenty-four million, eight million dollars a year. I think this is a solid signing for this team. Yeah, I think so too. I know that I was out to dinner for our daughter's first birthday when the signing happened, and I think it makes so much sense when I saw the numbers, when I saw the term, when I heard about the news, because I think it does two things. I think one it makes it very obvious that this team still should and probably will take a receiver very early in the draft. I think they're Mm -hmm. still looking for a legit number two receiver. I think Curtis Samuel has that upside, but I don't think the bills are banking on it. I think Curtis Samuel is here to be a really good dynamic number three receiver. Maybe he's a three a and Khalil Shakir is a three B, but I think they're still kind of big game hunting for another legit guy somebody who can maybe eventually take over a number one spot whenever Stefan Diggs time is done in Buffalo. So it checks that box. And it also checks the box of a dynamic playmaker who can run after the catch, who can play all over the field. He is a chess piece that they can use in a lot of different ways. And he's had success with Joe Brady. And I think that's the big thing here. We probably you brought his name up a lot. We collectively probably should have seen this coming, given the connections, the Carolina connection, the type of player he is, the market the Bills were in. It just seems like it makes too much sense for both sides. Yeah, I agree with you. And I liked him always because I felt that he was always this kind of guy the Bills have been searching for, which is a guy who could be dynamic with the ball in his hands at different positions on the field. Let's think, Matt, about the trail of breadcrumbs here for the last few years. The Bills thought they signed J.D. McKissick. They really wanted that guy. They wanted a guy like J.D. McKissick. They thought they signed him. He went back and, you know, signed him with the Bills. They didn't get him. That would have been a receiver out of the backfield. So what they do, they go and they draft James Cook. What was he? A receiver out of the backfield. Yeah, running back who can play a receiver. They've been after this type of back for quite a while. Um, there's somebody else's name has even escapes me, but I'm... They, not he minds. Na- Thank Hines. you. There you go. Naeem Hines. You think mm-hmm. that's why I've been up since 530. Um, Naeem Hines. And that's right. Running back. This is the same thing, but he plays receiver who can play running back. In fact, he had like 42 carries one year, just a few, few years ago. He had 38 carries last year. I believe it was. This is a guy who, and I know that the comparison is always made for these type players to Debo Samuel. And it's not fair, but at least I think he gets you closer to that comparison than a lot of other guys you could bring in. Um, I saw a stat from, I believe it was Matt Harmon, Reception Perception. Pretty amazing. He said, and his stat was, of all the non-running backs, we're also non-quarterbacks because quarterbacks have a lot of yards per carry because of the scrambling. If you take out quarterbacks and running backs, Curtis Samuel is second to only Debo Samuel in yards per carry and rushes. Yeah. So non-quarterbacks, non-running backs, this guy with the ball in his hands makes things happen. So here's the breadcrumbs. What did Sean McDermott talk about? Explosive plays, big plays, rack. What did Brandon Bean talk about? Rack, explosive plays. That's what this guy can bring. Rack, explosive plays, ball in his hands, making plays. He also brings separation. And I think that there's been a misconception in t- at times with certain fans, not even just in Buffalo, but all around the country, football fans everywhere who think that you need a big receiver to go win contested catches. And at times that makes sense. But the thing that's better than any of that 
are guys who can separate because it's easier to hit guys when they have a couple different, a couple extra yards of separation than it is when they don't have separation and they have to try and win a contested catch. And I don't have the stat in front of me, but Curtis Samuel averages more separation than most of the players in the league. I think it was like three yards of separation on his average route run, which is really impressive. And a lot of that is because of his speed. You brought up the Debo Samuel comparison, which has been funny because I've, accidentally said Debo Samuel at times this week when referring to Curtis Samuel and vice versa, just because it's hard. They get like inner twisted Mm -hmm. in my head. The name that I actually said to you on the radio a couple days ago, and that I really like is Percy Harvin. There are a ton of overlaps here with Percy Harvin and with Curtis Samuel. They're the same height. They're not that different with their speed. Now the thing here, Curtis Samuel is not going to contribute from a special teams role, or at least I don't think he's going to like Percy Harvin did for all those years when he was in Minnesota. But Mm -hmm. Percy Harvin was a really dynamic playmaker, even on offense. And if you go look at his stats, you go look at his numbers for the first several years of his career, they are eerily similar to what Curtis Samuel has done. Now, Percy Harvin had a couple more or more receiving yards, but Curtis Samuel had more catches. So it's not like the perfect comparison, but it's a pretty good one. And I think if you remember, a lot of people do. Percy Harvin, you really like the idea of a player like that in the Bills offense. Are you concerned at all buying into some of the talk that people say they don't really know the fit because he plays a lot in the slot? And the Bills already have Khalil Shakir, who really stepped up last year, and Dalton Mm -hmm. Kincaid, who plays a lot in the slot. Is that something that concerns you at all? I don't think they would have brought him here if it was something that they thought was overly concerning. I think that they want a lot of different options. Maybe that means the offense looks a little bit different next year than it did this year, which I think is a challenge for Joe Brady, but I also think it's something he's ready for. He kind of inherited Ken Dorsey's offense and then had to make tweaks to it to get it to what he envisioned. Now he's got an entire offseason as the guy where he can really kind of put his imprint on what he wants the Bills offense to look like. I'm not concerned. I am curious, though, because I really did like what we saw from Khalil Shakir down the stretch. For some reason, the other day, I watched a video that was every Dalton Kincaid target and catch from this past season, and I left that thinking, wow, he's going to be really good. So there's only so many targets to go around. He already is. There's only so many targets to go around, but if Curtis Samuel is what we think he's going to be, he'll end up having... 50 catches in a bunch of big plays. Yeah. And um, I agree with you, your, your front part of this, which is look, I mean, it's not like Joe Brady. I, I can't imagine Joe Brady's like, no, I don't know how to fit him in. I don't know where I'm going to put him. I think the opposite. Joe Brady probably went to Brandon Bean and said, I know how to use this guy. He had his best year when I was calling plays. I'll figure it out. I mean, look, there's been this, there's been this trend over the last whatever years anyway, in the NFL to have kind of like positionless offense, right? Guys just move around. Mm-hmm. You create mismatches. It's, it's what's happening on defense, too. You just kind of move everybody. You don't have to be an, an, an necessarily an X or a slot. Some guys are better suited that way, but you can move them around. You can do different things with them, and I'm sure that Joe Brady has a plan for Curtis Samuel bringing him in here, and that's why the Bills did it. So I like the move for the Bills, but I also agree with you. It does not take them out of taking a receiver early in the draft. One other misconception. There have been people who have said online and even in my group chats that Curtis Samuel reminds them of Deontay Hardy. And I want to make it incredibly clear, not even close. First off, Curtis Samuel is five inches taller than Deontay Hardy. But the second thing is Deontay Hardy in his NFL career has he has how many catches over the course of his career? 44 catches over the course of his career or excuse me, he has 79 catches over the course of his career. For comparison, Curtis Samuel had 62 last year. He had 64 the year before. So it's not like this is just a gadget guy. Don't hear this signing, see this signing, and say, ooh, we can run out of the backfield, but that's just another gimmick. Oh, maybe he can get 20. Ca-. No, th- this guy is a legitimate player. He had more catches last year than Gabe Davis had. So he's going to be involved in this offense. There is no question in that. Curtis Samuel added to the Bills' offense, but they have lost several key players. Matt, before we get to the players that they lost, I want to talk about something else here real quick. You 
tweeted out earlier today after Selection Sunday or during, because it is Selection Sunday, that you're not really super big into college basketball, but you need someone to root for. And I'd like to throw it out to all of our listeners. Help Matt root for a college basketball team. Let's find a reason. Like, what's it? I want to know what's important to you. Like, what would you base your team on? Who you'd root for in the tournament? I want, I like underdogs. Okay. I like everybody loves the Cinderella stories. Uh-huh. I don't like blue bloods just because okay. I'm sick of seeing the same teams over and over again. Yep. And somebody who, and a team that's got like a really dynamic player because i think in march that's when the stars shine the brightest so those would be the boxes that i would check this contradicts it a little bit did you see the reply to my tweet i did not so right now i'm leaning towards florida and the reason i'm leaning towards florida is because their assistant head coach is Mm -hmm. carlin hartman who is from grand island yeah and one of their directors of like I don't know the name of his title, but a guy named John Sapphire, who is a Williamsville South graduate or Williamsville North graduate, one of them, he's also involved in the program pretty highly. So you've got two of the top guys in that program who are directly from West New York. And I believe there's another person in their recruiting program who's from Western New York. So you've got three different Western New York connections there. And I've got relationships with Carlin and John, just friendly. Hello. And I play fantasy football with John. So for that reason, I would like the Florida Gators to do well. But at the same time, after that, any just set John okay. Scott's at Dayton. I know he went to Dayton. Like there that's you go. cool. I like I like the A10. I Somebody like that. said Duquesne. Duquesne's in it. Vermont. They like are? Those are the school. Yeah. Those are the schools that are up my alley. What about just connections like Nate Oates at Alabama? Is that too blue blood though? Alabama these days. No, it's not too blue blood. Um I root for people instead of teams sometimes, right? So yeah, I I hundred percent agree. Like I do not like the Florida Gators as someone who used to live in Florida and they were kind of shoved down my throat. But all Mm -hmm. apologies there when I say I will root for Carlin Hartman. If they win, I will be very happy for Carlin Hartman. I agree with you. Big Bills fan. Got to know him as well. Um, But I'll root for Nate, right? Not that I love Alabama, but I'll root for Nate Oates. I think that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. I think that they had a lot of success when they were in Buffalo and kind of turned around that program for several years. Is Arizona Mm -hmm. State in it? Is Bobby Hurley even still at Arizona State? I don't even know. I'm so out of the loop. Is he still there? I will. I was really interested it's unfortunate that the big four teams did not advance to the tournament. None of them, a couple of them went on some runs for men's and women's, but the Niagara women's team was pretty close to knocking off Fairfield, who was nationally ranked. They were the 25th team in the country. But the interesting thing there was that if they would have won, I think Niagara would have been a very low seed. And I was sitting there wondering, could they play against Caitlin Clark? Could they play against Iowa? Cause I would have been glued in on that. I will watch Iowa's games for sure because she is electric and then I'll I mean the first couple days of March Madness are so fun even when you don't have a dog in the fight but Mm -hmm. then I get a little bit less interested as time goes on all right one more I'll throw out to you the head coach at Creighton which would fit your Creighton not a blue blood underdog Mm -hmm. like just mid mid major but always in the the head coach his last name is McDermott it's Greg McDermott I don't think there's any relation but it's that's his last name (laughs) All right. Well, his brother is with the Philadelphia Union, right? That's maybe there's right. Another, maybe there's another brother we don't know about, and he's in college basketball. <laughs> All right. The uh, tournament's going to get going this week, and that should be fun. Although, obviously, no Syracuse, so I'm a little less invested, but I'll root for players instead of teams. Speaking of players, the Bills did lose some several key players this week to other teams via free agency. We talked about Dane Jackson the last time here on the pod. Since then, Trent Sherfield, Puna Ford, Tyrell Dodson, Tim Settle. Would you and I both agree Tyrell Dodson's obviously the biggest loss of that group, right? Sherfield, uh-huh. Dodson, Ford, and Settle? Of the group, yes, but I do, I don't know if I would quantify it as a big loss. I know what you're saying. I don't think any of those guys leaving changes anything for the Bills next year. Tyrell Dodson would have been the fifth linebacker on this team, so it's hard right. to quantify it as big. Would but he? Of well, the group, well, let, I don't know if he biggest. would next year. I mean, maybe. I still think he could be the third linebacker next year, but I think Nicholas Morrow has a chance to be the third linebacker next year. They've already replaced Tyrell Dodson, so I agree with you from that standpoint. But I don't think there's anything that necessarily would have told me that I was sure that Williams or Dorian Williams or Bill Inspector would beat out Tyrell Dodson to be the main backup. 
I mean, you, you'd like it to happen, but I think Tyrell Dotson played really well this year and proved that he could be a really good backup. And I do think it's, it's a loss on the roster. Yeah, it's a loss on the roster, but you spent a third, not you, but they spent a third round pick on yep. Dorian Williams. And yep. I feel a lot of similarities between Dorian Williams and us not knowing much about him and Terrell Bernard and being in the same position a year ago and having all these different questions at linebacker and Terrell Bernard just becoming an absolute stud. And the thing that makes Terrell Bernard so spectacular is he is a freak athlete, as is Dorian Williams. Now, you don't want to see Dorian Williams on the field a ton this year. You want to see Terrell Bernard and you want to see Matt Milano. But given the resource that they resource that they used to get Dorian Williams, he better have a role on this team that isn't just necessarily special teams. Maybe they have certain packages that they try and get him in because he is such an athlete. Maybe they use him more in coverage situations. Maybe they're doing a little bit of a different look this year. We don't exactly know, but I would say Dorian Williams and I would say Balen Spector just because I know he's not a high draft pick, but he's another draft pick and they seem to really lean on those guys. I mean, they went to Balen Spector when they had all their injuries this year and then he got injured again in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that like it they can overcome it. He's very replaceable, right? Um, but I just think that, you know, when you get in a situation like they were last year in the playoffs and you can turn to a guy like Tyrell Dotson who can play both positions and, you know, did the things he did for them, you know, it, you, you, you want to be careful that you're not leaving yourself. But I do think that Nicholas Morrow could obviously, you know, fill in and be that next guy. The Bills obviously signed Nicholas Morrow. He was with the Philadelphia Eagles. He was with the Bears before that had 116 tackles one year. What about the other guys in that list? All replaceable, but any thoughts on losing Sherfield, Puna Ford, and uh, Tim Settle? I think Tim Settle never lived up to the I don't, as the hype the right word yeah. but there was a lot of buzz when they got yeah. him that in an expanded role tim settle could be a nice player and he was a fine player but he was a, rot a rotational defensive tackle i'm guilty of that i'm guilty i really thought that he was going to be a mm -hmm. much better player and producer than he was for the bills because i thought in washington he was the kind of forgotten guy amongst that really great yeah. D line they have where when he was on the field he was very good but it might have been a product of just those guys being around him yeah, that's absolutely valid. But the reason the Tim Settle one's a little bit con more concerning to me is maybe the word is just because of the lack of depth they currently have there. If they have an injury to a defensive tackle as of right now, they're kind of screwed. Now, they will go out and get somebody. They could draft somebody early. They could use one of their first two picks on a defensive tackle. I'm almost anticipating one of their first picks is on a wide receiver and the other is on a defensive tackle and they just kind of figure it out at safety. That's what I think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But even then you need other guys. And I don't know, does Jordan Phillips come back? I have no clue. Does Eli Anku come back? I, I don't know, but like, what are well, they he's under do? Con Eli Anku's under contract. He's on the roster. So is he, they have three defensive tackles on their roster Correct. right now. Yep. That's it. So it's wow. So they, they got stuff to figure out and, I don't know what they're going to do. I know they've had a couple visits in. I know there was the connection to Eric Armstead. We haven't talked about yeah. that. We talked about them potentially signing him, but it sounds like they were very much in the game. And when you see those numbers, that's pretty eye opening that it seems like it is certainly a position they are still considering. I agree. I wonder if that's it, though. The numbers that were eye opening, that's why they weren't, they didn't do it, right? They're like, hey, that's just too much for us. I mean, we're not going to have any money to kind of do the other things we want to do if we go Eric Armstead. But I agree. I think defensive tackle is very much at the top of the priority list, along with still wide receiver. To me, we, we, we started this process with wide receiver, defensive tackle. I think we're still at wide receiver, defensive tackle, right? After a week of free agency. I still am surprised they haven't gone out and got a safety yet, given the yeah. safety market. I'm really surprised. I thought that that might be the first domino to fall. And I'm still really interested in Micah Hyde. I okay. feel like we should know more about Micah Hyde um, than we do. Yeah, I just, the, I know, do, do you think that every, I think the way you say it, said it on the radio when you were on with us the other day was for every day that goes by, you think it's po more possible he could come back. I almost look at the opposite. Like every day that goes by, I feel like I hear nothing, which means that we're just not going to hear anything about him anymore. I think I'm the other way still. I think okay. every day we go by with them not having a safety added yeah. is a day that I wonder a little bit more, is there a chance Micah Hyde wants to play one more year? And if they want him to, and he wants to, I think it would be a very 
team friendly contract. I mean, Jordan Poyer's getting what two million dollars to go play in Miami. That's not immediate starter walk in the door money. That's a right. hey, we think that you're going to make the roster, but you know you get a little bit extra because you've been such a good player in this league. If the Bills had that offer on the table for Micah Hyde, I think they should do it. It just is all completely up to Micah Hyde. Would he want to stay? Would he want to play another year of football? Would he want to play another year of football without Jordan Poyer? I don't know the answer to that question, but I also know he hasn't at least announced a decision yet, which kind of keeps the door open. Micah Hyde, one of eight remaining Buffalo Bills free agents who have yet to sign either back with the team or somewhere else. It's Micah Hyde. Here, I'm going to I'm going to give you these names. You give me a some sort of reaction, whether that's a word, a sound, whatever it is, yeah. right? Like, okay, mm-hmm. here are the eight remaining Bills free agents who have yet to we don't know what's happening with them. Micah Hyde, what do you think? Yep. You give, give me some, okay? Uh, undecided. Undecided. Great, t- Tyler Medikevich. Probable to come back. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. They always do it, right? He's like, it's yeah. the, it's the, okay, we, you're, you're sitting there in mid May and they just re signed Tyler Medikevich to a one year deal, right? That's what happens yeah, every year. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Jordan Phillips. Um, also, pro- I think he comes back. Okay. He, he talked about possibly retiring when yeah, we saw him in, in the locker at the, but guys do that sometimes. I, I feel like he, he'll want to play again too, though. Yeah, if he wants to play, it'll be here. I, I do think yeah. that. Linval Joseph. Unlikely. I, I don't think. He, uh, yeah, and, and I don't want to say no shot, but unlikely. You know what he's going to do? He's going to sign with a team in November again, like he has the last two years, Philly and then probably, Buffalo, right? Probably, <laughs> si- probably sign with the Bills again in November. <laughs> I think this next guy I'm going to say is probably, of all of them, maybe the most likely to resign, Shaq Lawson. Yes. Right? I, I'm almost I'm almost banking on it, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the offensive side. By the way, five defensive players, only three offensive players. We don't know their kind of fate yet or what's going to happen with them. Kyle mm-hmm. Allen. No. Unlikely. I Zero to me. They have no. Allen Trubisky and Buschel. Not Buschel. zero. Come on. You, you don't You don't think he could just become this version of Matt Barkley? No, because I'll tell you why. I don't remember a time under this regime the Bills have brought four quarterbacks to camp. Um, they've had to have had four quarterbacks at camp. Uh, right? Maybe the COVID year with Jake Fromm. That was it. Okay, that was it. I, I, I unlikely. I, I don't think. It's and why, if you're Kyle Allen, why would you sign when they just signed Mr. Trubisky back as quick as they did? Because you got to go. Best, you if you're Kyle Allen, you want to go somewhere to actually compete for the backup job. I think the Bills, the writing's on the wall that they want Mr. Trubisky to be their backup. Don't you does Kyle Allen really have that many options to go compete for backup jobs? Sure, backup jobs, I think he would. Yeah, I guess. I mean, are you comfortable in Buffalo? Do you want to just keep working with your best friend and hang out? I mean, I don't know. These are the things that you have to weigh. If you're gonna get a million bucks, the bills are gonna pay I mean, he's a veteran salary. He wants gonna cost too much, but you still gotta Uh pay him a little bit to come back. I just don't I guess I just don't see it from the bill standpoint more than anything. Yeah, I mean, it's unlikely, but I'm not counting yeah. it as impossible. All right. Latavius Murray. No, no. It's done. No. Doors closed there. Here's an intriguing one. I say it's unlikely. I'm sure you will agree, but I don't think it's a zero chance, and that's Damian Harris. Oh, I don't think it's a zero percent chance. Okay, good. Okay. I'm almost willing to – I don't want to say it's likely. Really? I think it'd be 50 I, – I, I don't want to go to likely – but I would say like 40, 60, 40 percent chance okay. he comes back because right now what I'm trying to figure out, and this is kind of this sets us up in a, a nice little segue here. So yeah. we haven't talked since they've re-signed Ty Johnson. That's right. My question is, is Ty Johnson the number two running back on this team? Because if right he, now is, he is, is he, if he in is September? I don't know. Probably, I, I think he might be. Yeah. If your plan is for Ty Johnson to be the number two running back on this team, then I would bring back Damian Harris just as somebody who, you know, you probably liked a lot until he got injured. He can be good in short yarded situations, which is why he was here in the first place. seems like he's a real locker room guy. If Ty Johnson is your plan to be number three, then I don't think Damian Harris comes back because I don't think he's a number two. I almost am viewing Damian Harris like Latavius Murray last year. And that's why I don't think that it's impossible. Do you think that 
the better option for the Bills or the option they even preferred, how, whatever you want to frame it as your own opinion or what you think they would do, would be Damian Harris or a mid to late round pick? I guess it depends on how many picks they actually have uh-huh. and how much maneuvering they do. If they have all 11 picks, then they should use one of them on a mid round running back because you have, you know, some free throws at the dartboard to see if you hit. Yeah. But if they trade a bunch of them to try and get up, like, let's say they love Brian Thomas or they love a wide receiver and they use a fourth and a fifth to move up from their current spot. Then I think you just go sign a free agent because you have other more pressing needs. You still want to address certain positions with the, eight draft picks that you end up having or the seven draft picks that you end up ha- having. Do you want, all right, let's, um, tell, what do you think about Ty Johnson resigning? I mean, other than, like, you know, we just touched on it, but you know, just the thought of him being back on the roster and you know, whatever role he plays. I thought every time he touched the ball last year, not every time, but most of the times he touched the ball last year, he had juice to his game. I like him a lot. I, I think that he's versatile. I think that he can do a little bit of everything. I think that they trusted him. I think that he's a really smart of all of the guys that were becoming free agents this off season. To me, he was the most obvious that they were going to try and get him back because I thought he was effective. He's young and he was not going to cost the money, a bunch of money. And that's why I think he's coming back. I mean, I I really like him as a player. Yeah, I agree. I, I think especially, you know, it seemed like in this, we talked about this on the pod when it happened Mm -hmm. for some reason, Ty Johnson wasn't Ken Dorsey's guy, but he was Joe Brady's. When Joe Brady took over, he used Ty Johnson and mm-hmm. he had never really been used. And then he did. And he did nice things. I, I, I yeah. like the signing. I mean, he Reset. averaged four, he averaged yeah. 4.4 yards a carry last year. He had, I mean, 132 yards, but only on 30 attempts. He had a couple games where he was an effective receiver. He had seven catches for 62 yards and another touchdown. I, I thought that he would, did pretty well. And there's also something to be said that like he got touches in playoff games. And I know the Steelers game got a little bit out of hand at the end. I mean, he had 15 attempts in two playoff games. That's not nothing. That's them trusting this guy. All right. uh, A couple of things happened in the NFL. We need to touch on as well. Before we do that though, Matt, I have a suggestion for a team I forgot about, but it just dawned on me as we were just doing the last segment for you for the NCAA tournament. Okay. Here's a connection to Buffalo. Former Buffalo Bills defensive tackle, Anthony Hargrove's son plays for Florida Atlantic. The Owls, his name is Trey Carroll and he's really good. Oh, cool. Florida Atlantic is one of those like Cinderella teams from a couple of years ago, right? Did they go to the final four? They did last year. They went to the final four. Wow. That's wild. Yeah, they got um, they got a little over. I, people say they got overvalued and overinflated this year. They didn't have a good enough year to have an eight seed, but they got an eight seed. But Trey Carroll is a guard for uh, Florida Atlantic. He is the son of former Buffalo Bills defensive tackle Anthony Hargrove. So if you're looking for a Bills connection, there you go. Very cool. Very very cool. The other thing I wanted to, you know what? I got one more thing. I will we'll get to after this. And a, a final thing that I'm 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 looking for some help out there, but I'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about what the. Uh, Pittsburgh Steelers did. Whew. They traded Kenny Pickett to the Philadelphia mm-hmm. Eagles mm-hmm. after signing Russell Wilson. And then they traded for Justin Fields in basically a weekend. The Pittsburgh Steelers transformed their quarterback room from Kenny Pickett to Russell Wilson and Justin Fields thoughts. Yeah. They went from a bad quarterback room to a mid quarterback room. You know what? <laughs> Just very, I like Justin Fields. I think Justin Fields is a better option than Russell Wilson, to be uh-huh. honest. Like, I think that if you're trading for Justin Fields, there's potential there. I, I don't know what they're doing, right? I, I like the Justin Fields move, but next year he's owed a ton of money. So if you're going to end up paying him, or or it depends on what you're trying to do, but I think they backed themselves into a corner if they told Russell Wilson that he was going to be the starter, which it sounds like they did, which is why they had to trade Kenny Pickett. I have no issue with them trading Kenny Pickett because I don't think he's good, but I think Russell Wilson is also pretty average and Justin Fields at least has upside. If I was the Steelers, I would be starting Justin Fields this year. Really? Um, I would not. I would start. I, I think that Russell Wilson is a better quarterback than Justin Fields. 
And I think you have a better chance to win overall with Russell Wilson on the field than Justin Fields. I don't think that he's great necessarily. He still had a pretty, you know, Russell Wilson had a much better year than people realized last year, actually, if you go look at his numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a team that believes that they can kind of make a jump and compete. And I don't know if that, to me, Justin Fields is way too inconsistent and I'm not really sure what his future holds. Whereas I at least think that Russell Wilson can stabilize them. Russell Wilson is a more polished Tyrod Taylor, not as a player in his entire career, but what he did last year was a Tyrod Taylor bill season. Do you really think that level of quarterback play, even with an elite defense is good enough to do anything in the AFC or even in the AFC North? Cause I, I get, I get they were a playoff team last year. So I understand the argument of, well, we got to the playoffs with Mason Rudolph last year. Imagine what we could do with just solid quarterback play. And I'm like, yeah, sure. But also all of those guys who were really important for your defense are now another year older. And I know you've got Mike Tomlin, but I just don't trust Russell Wilson at this point in his career. He hasn't been good in a long time. Like he hasn't been really good. He's been pretty average. Either way, I, I don't see how the Steelers or anyone else is going to be paying Justin Fields anytime soon. So he's going into the final year of his deal. Um, they did not pick. They, they they have until May. They have two months, less than two months to pick up the fifth year option. They're not doing that. I can't see the Steelers picking up Russ, uh, Justin Fields' fifth year option, which means he goes into the fourth year of his deal and the last year of his deal because you're not going to pay him what it would cost for fifth year for the for for, for that for a guy who's going to be the backup. It seems like. So then now another team's going to probably have a crack at him in free agency. So let's see where this goes Where with uh, Justin Fields. In the meantime, Kenny Pickett goes to the Eagles. Now, I'm going to get to the story about what was reported about why he was traded, but mm -hmm. he's going to back up Jalen Hurts, and where did it all go wrong for Kenny Pickett? It's just not that good. I mean, he's yeah. part of a draft class that might go down as the worst quarterback draft class potentially ever, and that's saying something considering – we all lived through the EJ Manuel draft class. That was also really, really bad. But this draft class was pretty terrible. Besides Brock Purdy, it was a pretty terrible draft class. So it looks like all of those teams that took a quarterback kind of whiffed on them. I think Kenny Pickett is a fine backup. But if you've got to start him for more than a bunch of game, a bunch of games, then you're probably not in a good position. Can I just here's the thing that I don't understand about the Fields trade. Sorry to go back to Justin Fields. Yeah, if you're yeah. not going to pick if you're not going to pick up his fifth year option, which they're probably not going to do, what is the point of this? If he's going to be your backup to come, let him be your backup for a year and then let him go. I think the point is if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, look what happened to them last year at their quarterback position. They're they're They don't, I don't think they care about what 2025 they want to be set in case they're in a situation where they need a quarterback. They had no idea what to do last year and who to turn to because their quarterbacks were not good. They were starting Mason Rudolph in the playoffs against the Buffalo bills. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like the bills at linebacker last year. Like, wow, like who do we turn to? But this is the most important position in sports. So my answer to your question is, yeah, they did it to strengthen their backup quarterback. Look, and he went for a six, Matt, which that tells you around the league. Most people only think he's a backup quarterback. That's all he is. So, yeah. but you're getting a good backup with upside and then you can evaluate. You can still franchise tag him if you really wanted to, if something happened, but I think that's the reason you do it. The reason is because you just feel like you need to be better at that position overall. I think that the Pittsburgh Steelers should be focusing on the long-term future of their team. I, I just, I, maybe they don't operate that way ever. And I know that that organization does not think that way. They always think that they've got a chance, but I think it would be so much smarter to play Justin Fields for a year because I don't think the drop off is that significant. And if he has an amazing year, then you know, you've got a quarterback for the foreseeable future. And if he doesn't, then you can start to look for one. Cause if Russell Wilson is the exact same player he was last year, then you are in this exact same position next year. Exact same position. They also traded Deontay Johnson to the Carolina Panthers. They're making moves. Um, I'm going to get to Kenny Pickett in one second, but I will also say, speaking of quarterbacks in the AFC North, how about this? The Browns, they have four now on their roster. The Browns have, yeah. the Browns have, and they're all kind of notable in their own way, right? Which is, they obviously have Deshaun Watson. They have Jameis Winston, they sign. They have Dorian Thompson Robinson, who started last year for them. And then they just signed Tyler Huntley from the Ravens, who I've always liked Tyler Huntley as a backup. He's number four mm -hmm. on their roster right now. Maybe three, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I don't get it. I mean, I guess if you don't have 
a ton of confidence in any of them. You might right. as well have a lot of them because then you never know what you're going to have with one of those guys. I mean, Snoop Huntley was a pro bowler not that long ago, so maybe they're <laughs> going to lean on. Maybe they're going to lean on that. And just they're spending a lot of money and a lot of resources on a quarterback room that isn't that good. So, Matt, did uh, you whatever. see? Did you see the report from Jerry Dulock, who covers the Pittsburgh Steelers from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, about Kenny Pickett? Did you read what he wrote? I didn't, but I did see reports out there, and I'm wondering if this is his report, that Pickett just asked for a chance to be the starter, and they told Russell Wilson that he was the starter? Is well, that that's part of the story. That's part of the okay. story. That happened. He asked for that because, apparently from Jerry Dulock, who writes for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I'll read his tweet. The Steelers made the move because of the way Pickett was poorly handling the arrival of Russell Wilson, according to sources. That came on the heels of Pickett's behavior last season when he refused to dress as the emergency third quarterback in Seattle in Week 17. Hmm. It almost feels like that's a little bit of mudslinging. You know what I mean? Like somebody at the team was mad. I mean, if it happened, then good you should trade them like you don't need those guys especially if they're not going to play for you or if they're not going to be your star nobody should act like that ever but especially for guys who are in the position that he's in nobody should act like that but i feel like sometimes after things happen people start to just really you know throw out some wild stuff so i'm always a little bit skeptical of what's true and what isn't true I agree with that you never know there's a lot of people with the reaction that you would imagine reading that like oh, i don't believe you i do believe you I absolutely would believe that he asked for a trade knowing that Russell yeah. Wilson apparently was told that um, there were, there was a lot of talk last year that he didn't want to dress as that emergency backup quarterback. I'm not sure about that, but what's interesting to me is if this is true, then the Steelers said, okay, Kenny, then we'll just trade you to the Philadelphia Eagles where you have even less of a chance to be a starter. You imagine how dumb you got to be to go tell Mike Tomlin that you don't want to play in a football game. Mike Tomlin, <laughs> I, I would be scared to go – well, not scared. I don't know if I would want to just go say, hi, Mike, how are you? Imagine having to go up to him and be like, no, screw you. I'm not dressing as a quarterback. I, I don't know if I ever told you my Mike Tomlin story from the owners' meetings a couple of years ago. Did I ever tell you that? I don't think so. I, I'm, I've always been a Mike Tomlin fan. I just think that he's he's my kind of coach, right? I, I know that he hasn't been as successful, and there's questions about that. So I'm not, and I know that he's like a guy that loves you know punting when he shouldn't punt. I'm not I'm not yeah. telling you he's an incredible coach anymore, but I just like his style. I've always kind of related to him the way he handles relationships and people and things like that. So I've always already had this affinity for him. So a couple of years ago, you know, Matt, you know that we used to because I think you were you were already in your position or at least covering the team when we used to always have access to the other team's head coach before a game, right through a conference call. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yep. That changed a few years ago. Now the coaches mm -hmm. have a choice. They don't have to do that with the opposing media anymore. Mm -hmm. Mike Tomlin always does. He always does it. And a couple of years ago, he was asked in a press conference, why do you still do your opposing media call every week with the beat reporters. You don't have to do that anymore. And he said, because we're all in this together, we're all in this ecosystem to get this ecosystem together in the NFL. We're all trying to help each other do our jobs better. He said, and I have respect for the people who do the job in this room. And I would hope the other coach would talk to you guys. So I'm going to talk to the media from the other team. And I'm like, wow, that that's amazing. Like here's a guy standing up for us and what we do and how mm -hmm. we want to do our job. So go to the owners meetings that year, which by the way, are happening next week in Orlando. So that year I go to the owners meetings and there's a big reception every year at the owners meetings on uh, Monday evening. We'll be there again this year. And all the coaches and GMs and owners are milling around. You can just kind of go up and talk to them if you're comfortable enough and whatever, however you want to do it. So I go up to Mike Tomlin and I say, hi coach. Just want to introduce myself. My name is Sal Capaccio. I cover the bills. I'm the bill sideline reporter. And I just wanted to thank you. And he's kind of looks at me weird. And I said, you know, you were asked this in a press conference and this is what you said. And it just stuck with me. And I really appreciate that you like said that because it really, I agree. Like we're all in this together and blah, blah, blah. And Matt, Mike Tomlin goes, Oh my God, man, thank you so much. And he gives me this, like this big bro hug. And he goes, come over here and hang out with my wife and my daughter for a little while. And I spent like the next 15 minutes getting to know Mike Tomlin's family simply because I said, thank you to him for doing that. That's really cool. It's really cool. Yep. I think a lot of these guys, some of them have larger than life personalities and some of them have this intimidating vibe that goes with them. But a lot of them are really cool, nice guys. And in settings like that, it's cool to see. I 
the opposing player, opposing coach press conferences and conference calls were always something that I would try and get on, especially if it was somebody who, you know, is a really recognizable coach or a really accomplished mm-hmm. coach. So for me, especially when I was younger in the, my career, whenever they did something with the Patriots, Bill Belichick used to do those calls. And I just thought it was cool that I could ask Bill Belichick a question about football. Right. And if it was a bad question, I didn't have to look him in the eye while I asked it. It was just over a phone call. Yeah. I mean, listen, it was always cool to do, but I will say that it's always a lot of times it's a waste of time. And you're right. I agree with you about Belichick, but wasn't it Belichick always kind of like, he was the guy that he he talked about Josh Reed, the receiver being on the bills when he was already removed from the team, like for three or four years. And he mentioned him on the team. I asked him a couple of questions about, I've asked him a couple of questions about Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, and I actually thought the answers were pretty insightful. And from what I've been told that sometimes he was more insightful actually with visiting media than he was with his own media, depending on the situation, depending on the topic. Okay. Final thing for everybody. Uh, in about a week and a half, my family and I were taking a big vacation. We're going to Australia, which is really cool. I've always wanted to go to Australia. Never been there. We have friends who live there. We're going to be going mainly to Brisbane, Australia. Okay. I, don't, I think it's a town near there, but that's where it is. I'm not super familiar with the geography of Brisbane. Here's what I need to know from everybody, Matt. I need to know if there's Bills fans in Australia that I can meet up with. I want someone who's listening to this to say, because I did it in Milan, went to Milan, Italy, and I went to the Bills backers bar of Milan, Italy. Now I've mm-hmm. looked into it and I've been told by the Bills, there is no Bills backers bar in Brisbane. There is one in Melbourne, however. I have not looked to see how far Melbourne is from Brisbane. I will do that. I don't think it's going to be close enough for me to go. But there's got to be Bills fans somewhere near Brisbane, right? So here's my call out to everybody. If you are a Bills fan near Brisbane, Australia, tell me where we can get together, say hello, whatever. I just think it would be super cool to do that. It is currently 8.07 p.m. on Sunday evening that we are recording this. Do you know uh-huh. what time it is in Brisbane? Uh, 8.07 a.m. 10 7 a.m. <laughs> so they are 10 hours. No, they're 14, 14 hours ahead, ahead of us. Yes. So a one o'clock game would be what time for them? That'd be one in the morning, three in the morning. Wow. So I'm sure there's Bills fans over there, but you got to be dedicated if you're waking up at three in the morning to watch the team play football. Night games would be great. Because you would yeah. just get to wake up and have yeah. breakfast and watch a, a well, primetime game in the middle of the morning. There's got to be people who grew up in Western New York, Bills fans who live in Australia now. There's got to be. It doesn't matter if you how go many, watch the games pe- at a bar or not. How many people do you think have moved from Western New York to Australia? Oh, I'm sure there are. I, I knew. I, I knew. Actually, the people we know who uh-huh. live in Australia that we're actually staying with. Now, they're originally from Ireland, but we met them in Florida. They lived and then they moved to Australia. Yeah. I mean, it's people move. incredible. Yeah, no, I know people move, but that's like people move from like cheek to to Lancaster. People don't move from, from <laughs> listen to Florida, Matt. Oh, prove them wrong, everybody. Prove them wrong. I bet you there's way, there's more Bills I, fans than you think. And I'm going to look right now. Hold on. Look, okay, go I ahead. guarantee there are Bills fans there. But yeah. I think that they are Bills fans because the Bills have become a little bit of an international brand and because Josh Allen is really good friends with Daniel Ricardo. That's probably one of the biggest reasons why you're going to find Bills fans in Australia. Do you know who Daniel Ricardo is, right? I know the name, yes. Okay, so Daniel Ricardo is a very, very famous Formula One driver. Yes, F1, F1, yes. And he okay. is from Australia. Okay. And he is like legitimately, he's from Perth. He is legitimately very good friends with Josh Allen. Like they've yes, become that's right. very good friends. I, so I, I know for that. people in Australia who probably don't have a ton of connections to the National Football League, I would bet the Bills are one of the more popular teams just because they love Daniel Ricardo so much and because he loves Josh Allen. I just Googled some stuff and I find this article from 2021 when Jessica Bagula was in the Australian Open about meeting up with Bills Mafia in Australia. I'm telling you. I, I, here we go. I need to find out. So I need people to help me out here. Well, I'm going to, I want to meet up with a, a Bills fan or two in, in Australia when I'm over there. Well, I will talk obviously before you leave, but that'll uh-huh. be an incredible trip. That's, that's how long is that flight? We're going to fly from Toronto to Vancouver, Vancouver to Brisbane. That's 16 hours that flight. You know, what's amazing is <laughs> I wouldn't have even known you go that way. I would have thought you wow. go over Europe and not over 
Canada and then over the Pacific. I think you can go both. I depending on how you want to do it, right? I mean, I, I'm sure people do both. Is the here's what I want to know. These are ridiculous conversations to be having mm-hmm. on this podcast. If you were in New well, no, because if you're going Toronto to Vancouver, uh huh, then yeah, I wonder if it the other way, how much farther that is. I'm gonna say I'm gonna have to look that up. Next time, next time we talk, we're gonna know about it. But we'll leave you with helping both of us out here. A help Matt root for a college basketball team in the NCAA tournament. B yeah. help me find some Australian Bills fans. Bills fans in Australia. All right. And we'll we're gonna have updates for you the next time we pod. Of course, you can always catch us wherever you pod in audio and then on video on the Sal Sports YouTube channel. Thanks a lot to our producer mike rabier always doing a great job anything you're looking up something you want to say something before we leave or you go you, you always go um west it okay. looks like okay from like where we are it looks like all of the flights that i can find to australia go that way all so right. you wouldn't go over like europe and africa and asia you would go the other way well, I, I'm glad we're doing it the right way, Matt. That, that's that's very comforting. I will say that. <laughs> what do you, what do, you do on a pl- what, what do you do on a plane that long? What do you do on a plane that long? Watch movies and sleep. I can't sleep on planes, which is hard. Uh, it makes you know. it makes long it makes long flights. I, th- that's gonna be difficult. my next com- my next conversation with you on the pod. Okay, I'm gonna ask you. Better have this ready. Like what I need to download or be ready to watch because I have no idea what the plane's gonna have. So I better be ready for that. You know, that'll be the that'll be the next episode. In the meantime, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody.